founder of Tiny Planet Digital, Julie Wang, and senior social impact manager at Carbon Ethics, Bian Mara, spoke to the Thrive community about productive employment and sustainable tourism opportunities in the post-COVID era. Julie and Bian's presentations were part of our SDG 4 and 8 Quality Education, Decent Work and Sustained Inclusive Economic Growth theme for the month. After the session, Julie and Bian kindly took questions from the audience. Um, so what I'd like to do uh, next uh, uh, is uh, transition to the uh, question and answer or the panel discussion uh, part of our, um, our talk today uh, and uh, give the opportunity for our audience members to, to be involved and, and to ask some questions and, and share some ideas. And uh, maybe just before I pass it to uh, our moderator Irmak today, which uh, she's based over in Turkey. Uh, so we have a very multicultural and uh, geographically dispersed group uh, joining us here today. But before I do so, just briefly, I just want to mention we've got uh, Sunil Shastri uh, in our audience today. He's an uh, expert on, uh, on ocean governance and uh, he'll probably have a few things uh, to, to add on to what uh, uh, Brian Mara said about uh, mangroves and so forth. But uh, thank you for joining us uh, tonight uh, um, uh, on this uh, particular session. So I see you got your hand up. You've probably got a question to go as well. Uh, can I pass it over to... Um, uh, do you have a, a question you want to ask straight up, uh, Sunil? Thank you. <coughs> so thank you. Thank you, Morris, for introducing me. Uh, my, my name is Sunil Murlidhar Shastri. I'm an independent consultant in ocean and environmental governance. Uh, I'm normally based in the UK, but I'm here on, uh, on a break to be with my mother uh, for a few months. Sorry. <clears throat> I just want to say something very briefly uh, about the ocean. Uh, and because uh, Morris uh, asked me to say something about mangroves, and the, the, the only thing I want to say about the ocean is, I mean, because I'm going to ask this question to Bianmara later about her Great Green Wall Initiative. And we always talk in terms of trillion new trees. And I call it TNT. So TNT, as you know, is an explosive. And trillion new trees, we want explosion of trees. And that's what this Great Green Wall is doing. So I congratulate Bianmara for that example. But uh, how do you do that in the, in the sea? And I, I look at it as, as this, that mangroves, which are in the coastal region or in the intertidal region, so they are number one. Then the second, we have what we call as the seagrass, which is somewhat deeper. And if you go a little bit more deep, then you have the corals. And I, it's my firm conviction, just, just as trillion new trees will save the planet on the, on the terra firma in the ocean, if you have more mangroves, if you have more seagrass, and if you have more uh, of these coral, then that's your triple insurance against climate change because ocean is, you know, 99% of our biosphere and ocean uh, is, you know, basically every second breath we take comes from the ocean. So I don't want to say more on that, but I want to have two questions to both the speaker, one question each to both the speaker, if I may, Oris. Uh, can we? Uh, I'll open it up to the audience, but you can come back to that. But thanks for for sharing that thought with us. And uh, thank you. Uh, Sunil is uh, very well uh, um, an expert in this particular area, so I think he has a lot to share with us. If I can just pass it to Irmak, uh, please, um, because I know you've been uh, discussing with the audience members or sharing. They've been sharing with you their questions and so forth. So I'd like to give you the opportunity to see what we've got there. Thank you, Marius. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank our present presenters for such uh, insightful uh, and engaging uh, presentations. So first of all, I would like to uh, start with a question for uh, Julie. Uh, I wanted to ask, are there any specific recommendations you give to your clients that will promote employment of young people from different backgrounds, identities, or needs, such as people with disabilities, people with migrant backgrounds, or people in the LGBTQ community? Um, yeah, this is the first question. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for the question. Um, 
So I guess my company being a marketing company, we just do marketing for our clients. But, um, you know, whenever I get to chat with other people uh, in my network or other small business owners, I really always encourage them to look into, as an example, the programs that I brought up today. And in order for more inclusivity and, you know, hiring a wider range of, you know, diverse employees, as well as um, marginalized employees, there are specific uh, actions you can take as a business, as well as resources you can seek out online. So typically, um, as a small business, we start off with a hiring plan that includes a diversity and inclusion uh, policy, uh, talking about how the company and organization can be de dedicated, including uh, to include people who are, you know, more marginalized or um, in a different kind of demographic than yourself um, to encourage that. And once you have that policy, then it's a really good handbook to, you know, inspire, you know, telling people who your organization is and connecting with those who are able to, you know, contribute to your organization. And then secondly, within a lot of the resources that um, I have identified there, um, a lot of the funding grants and sub subsidy are specific to different uh, groups. So as an example, I also work with the immigration services um, of my province um, to help newcomers get uh, in-demand skills in tech. And for them in that organization, they help you know, newcomers to Canada acquire jobs and they provide employment subsidies for employers to hire newcomers to Canada. So I would say, you know, start with your hiring policy first to get different types of people employed and involved in your organization. And then through these resources, you can seek out a wide range of different candidates that can either self-identify or not within the talent pool there. Hope that answers the question. Uh, yes, that does actually. Thank you very much. Uh, so for the second question is for uh, Biamara. Uh, you mentioned in your uh, presentation that conservation can sometimes um, clash with local needs. And I'm from Turkey and I experienced this um, in mostly our touristic regions where the local population relies on certain practices that risk the ecosystem. Um, but they still rely on it. So how do you overcome um, these type of challenges uh, with your organization? Yeah, thank you so much for the question. So also my organization encountered something like this, you know, like a protest from the community itself. So the first thing that we do is usually we get to know what's actually the main cause of um, the protest or, you know, the disagreement from the community itself. Is it because someone's... Um, you know, trying to just create a fire within the community because that's something that's quite common happening in Indonesia due to political situations or something else. So first, yeah, try to communicate and see if it's like a big deal or it's just, you know, a small or just a, yeah, just a small things. And then um, after that, try to communicate with also the community leaders to see if he or she can support us to communicate with the other parts of community. So what we do is that we usually approach only the key leaders of the organization and also try to have their trust first to us, which also requires a long, um, yeah, a long process for us to have that trust. And after that, um, yeah, usually it can, um, you know, it can help us at least to also gain again uh, more attention from the community. So they want to um, be gathered in the socialization and et cetera. But yeah, I'm not saying that it's an easy step since it's usually, it can take like five years to convince them that conservation is actually helping them um, to, to yeah, sustain their livelihoods. And sometimes what we do is that during socialization, we give a local context socialization. So it's more about that we connect with their past history based on our interviews with either government or other parts of, of community themselves so they can feel relieved and they can also feel um yeah threatened towards the current condition of climate crisis and i also believe that this is the work of um, not only one person not only one organization 
but we need also to be um, supported by the policy of um, the government itself. Like for example, um, in recent years, the government of Indonesia just um, agreed that we cannot cut down mangrove trees anymore and it's become illegal now because before people use it as wood fires. And then due to that um, policy, we it's really helped the organizations like my organizations to socialize and um, do a smoother um, actions on the field with the community. I hope that answers. Yes, that does. Thank you very much. Uh, so our uh, next question is um, for Julie. So um, many, uh, employers, they require uh, people with many years of experience, uh, but young people uh, that have just graduated, they obviously do not have this experience yet. Uh, so what can uh, these young people do to acquire uh, more experiences in their field to qualify for jobs in situations like these? And how can the employers um, promote jobs for recent graduates? Yeah, thank you. So to answer the first part of your questions, how can students and new grads acquire uh, skills that employers are looking for? So in speaking um, in mentorship with, you know, young students, recent grads and young professionals, one thing I really like to emphasize is alignment uh, as an overall theme, whether that is whether your resume is aligned or your CV is aligned with the role you are applying to, or if you know, the job role is aligned to your skills. Um, alignment overall, whether your LinkedIn profile is updated as an example and aligned to the roles you're applying for, um, that theme is really important. But aside from that, um, being really clear about you know, what you have done in the past um, that kind of supports this role. So this could be describing any transferable skills past projects that you have done that is relevant to the um, role, um, as well as kind of explaining, you know, where you are trying to get from point A to point B, right? So typically organizations want to see students who are, you know, ambitious, eager to learn, and, you know, have a well thought of career plan. So ideally, when you interview with them, if you're lacking in experience or skill, what you can offer is new ideas, new energy, and the willingness to take things from point A to point B. And that's really valuable to most organizations. So yeah, hope that answers the question. I believe there was a second part uh, to the question. I don't remember. Uh, yeah, how, uh, how can employers promote jobs for recent graduates? Yeah, for sure. So there is uh, a lot of ways that small businesses, at least in my experience, can get more involved uh, with, you know, recent graduates, student workers and young leaders, and that a lot of the a part is getting more involved on campus at universities and colleges, posting on their online job portals. And I found um, guest speaking at uh, schools have been a really good way to create my talent pipeline to attract students who are eager and willing to interact with you um, in that way. And this isn't limited to a university or colleges. Being um, a speaker uh, in a secondary school or a high school can really uh, do give you that effect as well. And as you speak, you can naturally identify students who are you know, interested in your industry, interested in the job role and who are eager and who would reach out to you directly. So then you can identify the motivation and attitude uh, directly that way as well as a business owner. Hope that helps. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so another question is, you mentioned um, some uh, Canadian pro uh, programs for young people. And uh, have you identified any current gaps in these programs that could be addressed in the future? Uh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So um, in my experience, some programs um, that you can select your own candidates as a business, and generally that works a lot better for most businesses to get the right fit and right candidates for the role. However, some uh, programs match you with uh, recent graduates or students directly um, within their own system. 
Um, and sometimes those kind of uh, placements could result in a mismatch between your organization, the role, and uh, the student or recent graduate young worker that is associated with you. So that might cause some com conflict because like I said earlier, alignment is really important when uh, their you know, willingness to work, uh, their vision, vision values, their why isn't aligned with your organization. It is challenging for them to feel engaged and continue to interact uh, with your business. Um, and uh, kind of lost my train of thought there, but um, sorry, could you repeat the question again? Uh, yeah, the question is, uh, have you identified any current gaps in the Canadian programs? Yeah. Yes, okay, thank you. So sorry, everyone, it is 1 a.m. where I am. So I'm a little bit off, but um, one of the gaps as a small business owner that people see is a lot of these wage subsidy programs pay out at the end of the um, program. So you have to, as a business owner, pay up front for the entirety of the student's time with you, and then you get some support payments um, at the end of the program. Um, so that poses a challenge for a lot of small business owners to be able to fork out that extra amount of money to create these opportunities for young workers. Although uh, the programs are improving and evolving, a lot of programs are starting to do a uh, first payment, midterm payment, and end payments to enable more small business owners to hire young workers as well. So that's kind of where I hope the direction of these programs would go. So there will be more opportunities and more businesses willing to participate. Thank you very much. Uh, and next, uh, Sunil had some uh, questions. Would you like to ask them? Uh, we can't hear you. Uh, yeah. Okay. Can you can you hear me? Thank you. Um, yes. Thanks. Thanks, Irma. Uh, now the first question I have is to Julie because um, you know you, you talked about. I mean, you do a very laudable job indeed. You know, doing things for the youth, actually, getting youth employment and a career. Um, because if you see the United Nations definition of uh, stakeholders, the first two names they mention are women and youth. So you you talk, you got the right people. Uh, but I was just wondering, uh, is there any kind of a positive or affirmative action kind of a role in your work to, to give more, more opportunities for women? So that's my question to you. And then I have a question for, for uh, Bianmara. And she mentioned about this great initiative. I loved it. Uh, I didn't know about it. So thank you very much for, for giving that example of this great uh, 8,000 mile great green wall uh, going from Senegal to, uh, to, uh, to Djibouti. Now, uh, obviously, I, I grew up hearing about you know, Paris to Dakar motor, motor car rally. And I think this is such a great initiative because that's, that's causing a lot of damage to the environment. This is positive stuff. Now, all I wanted to know was, Obviously, north of that wall, north of that green wall, is the Sahara de Desert. Now, is there a plan to move this green wall northwards? Because obviously, what we want to do is then arrest desertification, but more importantly, we want to also reverse desertification. So, I think from that point of view, is there a thing? Is there a plan to move this upwards so that you know more of the desert becomes also uh, a forest? If you if you see what I mean. So thank you for both the speakers and uh, please, if I could, uh, you know, get you to answer. Thank you. Uh, Julie, would you like to start? Yes, for sure. Thank you for your question, Sunil. Um, on the women's specific front, um, because I am a female entrepreneur, I don't, uh, I guess, have a specific policy uh, put in place to uh, focus specifically on hiring uh, more women in terms of affirmative action in my organization. But uh, of my core team, we're 80% women anyway. So it wasn't something I had looked into in a lot of detail, but definitely something I could do better on. But primarily, I'm really focusing on opening up opportunity to youth um, in general. But yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, and Biamara, would you like to continue? Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Sunil, for the question. So I want to clarify first, do you mean 
want to um, move, I mean, like expand um, the, the representation to upper part of Africa as well? Is that um, the question about? Sorry, I cannot. You start. You start from the. You start from the edge of the desert, which is which is where it is. You know, from from Djibouti to um, to Senegal. But I mean, once you once you got that eight thousand miles going, obviously it'll take time because I, I hear it's it's taken ten years to do fifteen percent of it. So it'll take some more time to get there. But once they have done that, I think would it be would are there plans to move this wall progressively upwards? That's what I meant. You know, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Sunil. So for the further plans, I've um, you know never heard about the future plans once it's already finished. Since you know, as you mentioned before, fifty percent, fifteen percent is reached within ten years, which is quite a you know slow, not a slow. I mean, I consider it quite small numbers. Where you know uh, what I I see actually from the project is that it's more um, also works as a symbol for the humankind that you know we can also work for the biggest threat in this planet which is you know it's represents by the sahel desert itself so yeah i i think um i mean like i never heard about the future plans but i think it works as also a symbol for all of us to you know um yeah um, play our part in conservation and also reforestation in our own communities uh thank you very much uh so for the uh, next question is for Biamara. Uh, and with carbon ethics, uh, do you uh, have any projects um, specifically for um, people of need, like people with needs, such as uh, disabled people or people with different backgrounds, um, such as migrant people, people of color? Um, yeah. Thank you so much um, for the amazing questions. So um, in terms of maybe the topics of the SDG8, especially focusing on women, youth, and also the less um, able um, communities. So the things that we've uh, been focusing is especially on youth and women. So through youth, um, it's actually quite similar what um, Julie's have um, already also done in her um, organization. So we are um, very open for development and also working with um, other organizations to provide a comprehensive learning and development for youth um, to have experiences in our organizations. And also for women, especially in our projects, we focusing on area that um, it is still, there's still inequality between men and women in terms of job opportunities. So we provide more pro, uh, sorry, programs and trainings focusing on women empowerment. And um, yeah, unfortunately for um, yeah, the other parts of less able or less um, privileged communities, we haven't really been focusing on. So in Indonesia, it's not, um, I mean, um, we never, you know, um, what is it called? Um, so someone based on the race, gender, or religion. Um, but um, Indonesia itself, we have um, quite a small issues in regards of um, international race. But um, I mean, within Indonesia itself, we have a very um, rich, um, yeah, wide range of race. I mean, Indonesia. So it's not more like American people or other parts of community members. And in my organization itself, it's actually, um, we have um, some international workers as well. Um, I mean, like youths from all over the world. So we're very open for any part of communities, but yeah, I think we can work uh, better to provide more um, opportunities for um, less able or disabled um, communities so they can also uh, contribute to the organization. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, to follow up, uh, do you, uh, it, as Carbon Ethics, do you work with uh, other international organizations or uh, other organizations from other uh, countries? Do you have any collaborations uh, or do you uh, intend to have in the future or is it just a local uh, organization? Yeah, thank you, Irma. So actually we are quite a new organization. It's only two and a half years now. Um, but we're very um, significantly has growing for the last, um, especially uh, the last one year. So um, at the moment, we are working with local governments, um, especially in also boosting them to create policy that is more uh, sustainable and also can support um, local employment and also conservation. And on the other part, we also work with international NGOs, um, especially we also assist them with bigger projects of mangrove restoration in Indonesia 
but yeah, we cannot, um, it's still uh, undisclosed of the name of the organization itself. Um, yeah, other than that, uh, currently we're still on the local context. So we, we, we are, um, with the, the project setup that we have in organization is that we are directly partnering with local communities and empower them. It's not like we have um, our um, local partner of NGO in the area that we're working in. So it's like a more a direct com communication with the local farmers, which, yeah, we don't have much, um, you know, um, collaboration with local NGOs. But what we do have is that, for example, now we have um, batik or craft um, programs and trainings for women in Sumatra. And then we work with um, one of the small businesses that are also already thriving in creating batik and crafts. So yeah, the kind of collaboration that's actually we're currently um, building on in our organization. Thank you very much. Uh, and the next question is for uh, Julie. Um, so how can we access the resources you prepare to help uh, employers? Are those available via consult consultancy only or do you have any content in your website too? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, like I said earlier, we are primarily a digital marketing company, but I'm happy to have any coffee chats uh, with any of you attending here. Please reach out to me on LinkedIn. Happy to just chat with you about my experience, the different programs and perhaps options uh, for your organization just for fun. Um, yeah, so let me know if you would like to speak on that. Uh, but this is not like a service we offer as a company or anything like that. Just happy to help. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so we are uh, about to be done with our panel discussion. So we only have uh, we only have time for one more question. Uh, so if you have uh, a question that you really want it to be answered, please. Uh, uh, text us in the chat. All right. Um, okay. uh, so for now, I don't see any. Uh, oh, okay. So um, I would like to uh, thank our uh, speakers. And I'd like to thank uh, all of you for your um, very interesting questions. Um, so um, we are sorry that uh, we couldn't answer all questions, uh, but there because we had quite a lot of questions actually, but um, we, we can follow up uh, on these further questions on a future event if um, you're interested. Uh, and now I would like to pass it to Morris. All right, thanks for that earmark and thanks for our two lovely ladies uh, for taking the time out of their schedule. Um, in one case, in the middle of the night, I know what it's like uh, that uh, having to do presentations two, three, four a.m. sometimes, but thank you for both of you for uh, taking the time out to present this evening and to um, uh, respond to some of the questions we had. For the additional ones that I see here, uh, we'll take them offline, maybe we'll give an, uh, if you like, we'll pass them on to you. You can have opportunity to maybe follow up with those, maybe either through a podcast, another webinar, or if you feel it uh, is uh, worthwhile, it could also be provided in a different format like we've had before where people have suggested doing a, a workshop or that sort of thing. We'll discuss that with you uh, offline as to how you may want to engage further with us in that regard. Again, I thank uh, the audience uh, for bringing up these questions.